This is the 17th, and for right now, I see the final message pertaining to holiness and sanctification, as there are plenty of other references in the Bible, but I have chosen, obviously, the selections that I've made, which comprise of the most, we'll say, the fullest part of understanding holiness and sanctification. We have traveled through the Old Testament and into the New. And last week, I brought you to Hebrews 12. We went from verses 5 through 11. I'm going to take you back to Hebrews because it seems fitting to me that almost every single week, maybe I've missed once or twice, but every single week I have referenced out of Hebrews, which has been the key drive for this series, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now I ask you the question, it's probably really silly of me to ask, but I'll ask it anyway. Who here in the time and when the time comes does not desire to see the Lord? Shouldn't be one hand go up. Good. Phew. <laughs> All right. So it became, it became important to me to understand, even though we're reading words on paper and the words on paper seem axiomatic or self-evident, it became a reality to me. It became absolutely clear that I myself did not understand what this meant. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So let me first do this. I would like to, I'd like to point out a few things which are obvious and some which are not so obvious. The first thing that is, I've said this before, so it's not new. The writers of the New Testament were not writing chapter and verse. The chapter and verse division was added so much later. They were writing letters. So it's important to understand a complete flow of thought. And when we are looking at sometimes how the King James, for example, translated and punctuated, sometimes that can bring up great problems because uh, the punctuation does not necessarily fit within the framework of what we're looking at. Although today I'll point out some punctuation that I believe will indeed be helpful. It's amazing. It's a miracle that the King James punctuation could be helpful to us. Um, because some of you newer listeners may not know my, my passion um, because we have, I would say, a quite complete collection of oldest, some fragments, some extent, of the New Testament dating back literally very close to when some of these writings were completed, we'll say within a 200-year period after. And that's what we have simply 200 years after. This King James was translated from some of those fragments or some of those pieces of information, if you will, say, I don't know, 400, the brain's not working that well, but some 400 and almost 10 years ago. But through the ages, there has been this dire attempt to essentially find out the meaning, not in English. Of course, the English version, the first go at an English version done by Wycliffe in the 1380s yielded something which is quite priceless but very difficult to read because it's in the old English which had not yet been shifted. The great vowel shift did not occur. So when we read the King James, we're looking at the English that was shaped by Shakespeare and that particular period which carries with it a lot of mm, rather poetic words, some archaic, not in use anymore, but I use this as a standard. When people say, why do you use it? Because it's what we use here, but I always do a translation if I need to from the original Greek or Hebrew. So in this case, my first point, uh, we're going to be looking at punctuation to get a better understanding. Second of all, the New Testament writers were not thinking that they were writing some theological treaties. Um, they were writing to individuals as churches had been established, and some churches went off the rails. Some churches were suffering. Some churches, just as soon as Paul or whomever came, preached, and set up shop and left, these were so vulnerable and open some of them succumbed to what I taught out of Galatians, which is the Judaizers, those who came back after Paul had left and said, no, 
you need the law. It's not just what Paul taught. You need the law. So Christ plus the law, which, of course, Paul was saying, once the law has come, you, once faith has come in Christ, you don't need the law anymore. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. In this letter written to the Hebrews, and this is what needs to be said to understand contextually what we're looking at first. I always tell you, if you're not looking at the context in which something was written, you'll probably end up in error in your interpretation. So really important. Uh, I've said this on the subject seemingly on every text that I've touched because I've watched people take one thing and out of one piece of information they glean from the Bible, they make doctrine. Well, if I was going to do that, I'd say, what you do, do quickly. <laughs> that, if you don't know, that comes... By Jesus basically telling Judas, what you got to do, go do it. And he went out and hung himself. I'm not suggesting that, by the way. I'm just saying if, if it was that simplistic. So it's very obvious that the Hebrews, those folks which we don't know the particular area perhaps or the church, but writing to the Hebrews and this book, it seems that it was for the sake of, in, or, or it was the intention of the writer to correct some errors but also to avoid the apostasy that was running rampant. Why? Because you, if you read this book, the writer is making an argument for the superiority of Christianity and Christ over the old Levitical system and how it functioned in the law. And everything is better than. Christ is better than. Now, to somebody who does not have faith in Christ, they say, well, that's terrible. You're putting down one for another. But not if you're reading the whole book, because when you read the whole book, you understand that God came and chose the people. Those people were chosen out from among people that he did not choose, namely the children of Israel. And what could have been did not happen that way. He chose the people. He told Abraham they'd go into bondage, and the fourth generation or so, they would come out richer, stronger, better, and be led into a land that would be theirs to possess. But the unfortunate thing is that those children of Israel, all they did was complain. They did not have faith or belief that God could, would, or... What, there was always a problem for them. So in their complaining and their grumbling, God basically at some point, after their 40 years of wandering in the desert, God just basically said enough. And essentially, he only let a few, a handful, enter into that promised land. Moses didn't even enter in. Moses had to... He pleaded with God to be able to look and see it from Mount Nebo, to be able to look down, look across to see it before God said, your time is up. Unless you think that God was too harsh on Moses, this is why there's much to say about Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses appears there with Jesus and his disciples and Elijah, of course. And in the book of Jude, how it says that they contended. The devil and Michael the archangel contended. They fought over the body of Moses, which tells you that Moses, beloved by God, was not forsaken, was not buried somewhere in the desert to be forgotten, but rather he was made an example for the people. So it's important to understand that when we talk about apostasy, apostasy can happen anywhere. This book deals with that greatly, how people would so easily fall away which is why it says over and over in places in this book, today, if you'll hear his voice, and not like as in the day of provocation, if you'll hear his voice, if you'll hear his words, he's still speaking to us today. Now, where I take offense at people calling this book archaic is I read and I see all the modern applications. I see the modern-day church, much like the Corinthians, overindulging in the rather superficialities of Christendom and not interested in the nuts and bolts that make up the believer's soul of steel to be able to make it through while you're living in this crazy world. I'd rather have that, I'll use the Bible, what it says about Joseph when he was in prison and iron entered into his soul. I'd rather have the iron of God enter into my soul and toughen me up for the journey than have the appearance of being a Christian and when my day has come at the very end, I will be like the person standing in the bus depot trying to figure out where, where am I going? Where, where do I go? What do I do? Because I don't have any instruction because I didn't pay attention to this book on what it is I'm supposed to be doing down here in preparation 
for not sleeping on clouds and looking at chair babies who play harps or flutes, but rather the work that will be assigned to you and to me. Heaven is not a place of rest. Do not mistake. Any of that is all the gibberish that people pile on. The Bible says we will return with Christ to rule and reign with him on earth. That also, by the way, I'm preaching about 10 messages here, also says, if you read carefully, that the earth will burn up and another earth will be recreated. And for some that say, well, where is heaven? Where will heaven, where will the population of heaven be? Read Second Peter, read it carefully, and read the book of Revelation. Because once the earth is destroyed, which is what the book of Revelation talks about, a third of the earth, a third of the people, a third of the sea, once that happens... There will be a burning up. There will be a destruction. And then there will be a recreative period, much like in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. So having said all that, it's really important that we we get on the right frame. We're not Christians because we're making a choice like, oh, gee, I don't want to go to hell, so I'll be a Christian. I'm a Christian because, first of all, the Lord called me. No matter what people say about searching him out, You are listening to me today because the Lord called you out. Nothing I could say could make you want to be here and listen. But if the Lord's called you out, and I don't care how late in life he's called you out, celebrate, rejoice, be happy. That means that all the while, all of your life experiences, God granted you to have maybe some of the most terrible tragedies, death in your family, divorce, the things that you thought My life will never be the same, but he brought all those to happen. If you will, God does enter into all things to say, now that you are walking with me, you might understand all the things that have befallen you were designed to get you to your knees, to begin to pray to me, to begin to talk to me, which most of us fail to listen. They fail to listen for what we should do in those times of crisis. So these folks, no different. They were succumbing to the pressure If you want to call it enemies, peer pressure, I don't know, but they were succumbing to it. So the letter is driving home this concept. What is important for me to point out is the connection between last week's message and this week's message, and it's not just the words holiness that tie it together. Let me say it like this. If you are in the book of Hebrews right now, and if you have a Bible like mine, page 1525, from the writer's exhortation to endure chastening, that which is affliction, suffering, what I've called our stick with itness in professing the gospel of Christ. When I say professing, I don't just mean me preaching, but you faithing as well. The connection between our last study last week and this week, if you look at verse 14, which is the text I've been using, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So our pursuit of peace towards other, others and our understanding of the holiness of God are helps for us to persevere in the faith and also to bring our attention to something very important. And I'm going to say this very slowly. No one is immune from apostasy. No one. I'd like to say we're protected somehow, but we're not. We're not whether it's life grading on us and the faith connection is broken, no one's immune to it. And these folks who had first-hand contact with a disciple or a second eyewitness to Christ, if you will, down the road, who wrote this letter, whoever this was, and I'm not getting into that argument, knew full well the potential for these people to fall away. Do you think somebody who says, not me, never, could be immune? Those were the words of Peter. Not me, Lord, never me. The one that was right next to the Lord did what he said he would not do. So I say to you, this is a good way of connecting the dots for us. But now, let me go back to the text. These two concepts, what we looked at last week, the chastening of God, and the verses we're about to look at, which I will read, they connect us this way. There is a horizontal relationship, and there is a vertical relationship. This is the stuff that most of us here go, ooh. But that horizontal relationship, that is between man and man, or man and woman, woman and woman, and I'm talking about relating to each other as two two faithing individuals, wherever you may be, that horizontal relationship is a microcosm, 
of our vertical relationship. Now, some of you may say, I don't believe that for a minute. But over and over and over, and that's how you make sound doctrine, this is repeated from the Psalms, from Proverbs. I can pick many different places that talk about the relationship man to man, sideways. So, someone who has not understood the chastening of the Lord, someone who says, this is unfair, this is unjust, may at the same time, when injury, affliction, assaults, or whatever come to you, fellow man, the same way you may be afflicted by God or suffer the chastening of the Lord, you may say, why should I put up with this? This isn't part of the package, but it is. And why is that? Because if you go back and you read Galatians, Galatians talks about the children of promise and the children of the flesh, those specifically, that passage is referring to Hagar and her son Ishmael, who ridiculed the child of promise, Isaac, ridiculed him. Now, I'm going to say this to you. If you, if you stay with the mindset that this is archaic, you'll never learn anything about yourself or the Bible in these days we live in. But why is it that there are so many Hagars with their Ishmaels out there looking in at the children of promise, those people who were born into the faith? And when I say born into the faith, born of God, into the faith. And they laugh. Oh, you fools. Oh, you, you foolish people. You can't even get along with yourselves. How do you expect to change the world? You know what? They're right. If you think about it, who would be inspired to join a group of people whose profession is love, peace, right? But actually how they live is a bunch of infighting, spoiled brat children who cannot get along because the pettiness of denominationalism, which has created this, well, if you don't sprinkle and you dunk, you can't be in my church. And if you wear makeup and if you should, God forbid, wear pants, you can't come here. Who the hell are you to tell me what my relationship with my creator should be when I'm reading from the book, God never says to me, I will reject you because of your pants, your hair color, your makeup, your speech, because over time, God says, leave that to me and I'll fix it. But no, we are, we're, we think we're perfect. All of this infighting, I'm only talking about Christendom right now. I'm not even talking about the rest of the world. And if you want to know why the world laughs at us, all of us, including the pseudo-Christians who like to laugh at us. It's because we are not living embodiments of what what we profess we believe in. I'll go back to something that's the perfect analogy because I think everyone can relate to this. And I've used this before, and I mean no offense, but it's the perfect one. Don't ask after you've just downed a whole bag of cookies and a whole pizza if those pants make you look fat. It's self-evident. It's the same stupidity that pervades the church. Don't ask the question why we can't get along because departure from this book to the little fractioned denominations brings about, this is my club, this is my group. In my group, oh, let me tell you a real life story here so we can get real. Not everyone in those denominations is against. But I just happen to know a certain individual who is friends with another individual who happens to be of of the Baptist choice in their preference and had the audacity to ask that other individual if they were even saved because they don't belong to any particular entity, let alone the Baptist church. Now, not everybody's like that. Why? I got a phone call from a dear saint, some of you are familiar with, used to be a longtime friend of Dr. Scott's from Florida just called to leave me a message saying that they were in a meeting, just happened to be a bunch of Baptists, and they all said, she's the best Bible teacher out there. So you can't say, and I'm not saying because they said it about me, just recognize when somebody's teaching the scriptures versus somebody who's babbling on about things that will not save your soul, and recognize, I've said this from the beginning, a right interpretation and a right reading of what's said in John when he says, other sheep I have. I think that was referring to people who are outside of the faith right now who eventually will be brought in. You don't know who's going to be saved. You don't know who's not saved, who's saved. It's none of your business. That's between that individual and God. But if we keep this up and we keep going at this, do you really think anybody in the world is going to say, wow, I'd like to be a Christian? 
And the reality is, if you want to, if you want to inspect why, it's, it's, I'm going to say it, I believe it's unfortunate, but why Islam has been on the rise. I'll tell you why. Oh, there are divisions. Don't, only ignorant people would say there are no divisions within that faith, but there are. All you got to do is look at the Sunni and the Shia, and, and that will give you an idea that people who share the same faith are still going at it. But I give them this. They have one book, and you are either going to the mosque or you're not going to the mosque, and there's no in-between. That's the problem with Christianity. We've become very complacent. There's a, there's a lot more people who are in-between or a lot more people who are out than the ones who are in can't figure out. If you're in, be in. Be all in. Now, that scares me. I'm afraid I'll lose my, my freedom. I'll lose my life. Well, that means you don't understand the book the freedom we get in Christ is to live more abundantly. That doesn't mean go off the rails and go crazy. It means to live life as God intended it for you. Now, the connection between these two parts that I just went off on a diatribe, so forgive me, I take you back there. The chastening of the Lord, if we are to endure it, if we are to appreciate it, understand it, and then what comes to us, Sideways, what, what is meted out to us from the Lord and what, will, what we will be hit with sideways from our quote-unquote fellow man or woman. So, I'm going to say it like this. The connection being peace or following after peace, the pursuit of peace towards others and understanding the holiness of God or helps to persevere in the faith and also, in the faith and also to bring our attention. As I said, no one is immune to falling away or apostasy. Now, all of this is bound together in what I've called the horizontal relationship. So let me read the passage that will make clear why I'm separating the two texts, as I did last week, keeping 5 through 11. Now we're looking at 12, and I'll read down until perhaps verse 17. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees... Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men. Any of the italics are added by the translators. I'll show you that in a minute. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. I want you to look at, there is a colon right there. They did good for once. So don't read this as an independent verse. You've got to read all this as one thought by the writer. Follow peace with all and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently. That's a call for us. Pay attention. Don't get distracted. Looking diligently lest any man, anyone, fail the grace of God. Another, now it's a semicolon. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know that how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now let me stop there and let me say this. There is a reason why this whole passage, this whole 12th chapter, deals with understanding holiness in a radically different way. If one is understanding the the way that God chips off the hard edges is to sometimes put us into the pressure cooker of life. And whether that be through hardships, sometimes it's through sickness, there's a myriad number of things that... And I'm not saying God does all this because he's some psycho who wants us to be in dire straits, but rather there's things that we are yet to learn. And the problem is we're so hard of being able to clear our minds and our thoughts to actually learn his way that sometimes God has no choice, but that's the way he's going to get our attention. And I've said this before, so much easier to pray and talk to God when the stuff's hitting the fan versus when everything's going great. Would you agree on that? So the writer has a very valid point when he says the chastening of the Lord. We're not to take everything that comes into our life as the chastening of the Lord. We could say some things are brought on by the devil. And if you're truly not sure, pray about it. But I'm saying this one thing to you, if it drives you to God, it's what that great saint 
Drummond used to say, if pressure drives you, and I think actually two different saints, one is John Wright Follett and the other one is Drummond, pressure never hurt anybody, but if it drives you to God, it'll help you, it'll save you, and if it drives you away from God, it'll kill you. So if you think of it in those, those ways, this section that we're dealing with is not only practical, it's very applicable. So let's take a look at the text, the things we might glean from the text, First, I'm going to look at translation of the verse for only one reason and one reason alone. There's really very little I want to deal with because I don't want to get into the tough stuff, except I want to talk about this. This is Greek, irenin, dioketi. And this word is what is being translated in your text, follow. I wrote it or translated as pursue. But I want you to look at something. I put some blue letters there. That is, in the Greek, a verb. The M means it's an imperative. It's a command. It's not saying, would you please. It's saying, do. Do this. So, pursue. And I'm going to explain exactly what that means. So many people have made a shipwreck of translating this. But follow or pursue is an imperative. And it is also present, which means it's ongoing and active. You do it. Now, a lot of people won't like this, but this is the way... This is the way I said to you sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. That's God's way. If we're too comfortable down here, you know you've sunk into the flesh. So what does this word follow or pursue? What, how should we interpret this? Because this, this actually kind of tells you a lot about the writer. This is very, very strange. I'm going to tell you a sidebar. You might think it has nothing to do with this, but it does. I happened to be up last night watching a program on public television because that's about all I'll watch nowadays. And that's when I'm, I'm home and I've got a little time where I can't sleep. Just happened to be a program on the region of Tuscany and how I knew this from, obviously, it's my culture, how they send dogs out to find truffles. And they have to find them in the ground they have keywords. The keywords for the dog is dove, find it. Where is it? And che, like you have it, but also to leave it. They don't want the dogs eating the truffles because those things go for $100, I think, a pound. A little thing like that could be a couple hundred bucks. Very, they're like jewels from the earth. They're just mushrooms, my goodness, but whatever. <laughs> but the idea is they set out every day to find the truffles. So it is the pursuit that may yield in nothing that day but they still go out there earnestly looking to find. So understand, and that's the best analogy I saw that. I thought, wow, that's exactly like that word, what we should understand that word as. Not as a rule, legalistically to be carried out, but you set your course to search out. What is it? First piece. And I'll explain why this becomes something very reasonable and very approachable and also very doable, without ever thinking that we're doing anything. To pursue, to follow, to go after, to hunt, to pray, to, with, the mindset is to to obtain, but also the knowledge is I may not obtain, but this is the way I will go out. So, what about this word peace? In the scriptures, You've got many references to the God of peace. That's Hebrews, what, 13, 1320? Is that the God of peace? Yes, 1320. Now, the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ. God of peace. Jesus is referred to in Isaiah 9, 6 as the Prince of Peace. We've got abundant references to God and Jesus Christ as King, Lord, or Prince of Peace. So we as fathers, we who are trusting Christ, I'm going to go back to that word, sanctification, for a minute. As God has placed his spirit in us, we begin, it's a small part, we begin to walk and understand God better. Not perfectly, but better. And as we begin so, there are things, attributes of God from that one deposit made in us, the Holy Spirit, that will flow through us. If we yield ourselves, which is what Romans 6 says, if we yield ourselves to these attributes, then they are attributes of God working in 
and through us, not us. Not us. But in and through us, that's God. So it's important to put these two words together, the imperative to pursue or to follow peace. Why? Because essentially, even though the text says, follow peace with all, let me go to my text for a minute. All is panton, not panton anthropon. That would be all men, or pantos, however you'd conjugate it. Just panton. It's, it is all. Remember, I told you, this book was translated at a time where some of the greatest sexist things are actually in the Bible, which if you look at the original, they don't even contain a gender. So I take no offense at it. It's the time it was translated. It's actually a wonderful reminder of how far and not far things have come, but it doesn't really matter anyway. The error is there. I make the correction. So it is not follow peace with all men, but with all. Scratch out. You're not doing any injustice. It's in italics in your Bible. Scratch out men, all. That's men, women, children. I don't know what other entities you might want to follow peace with, but whatever. I really don't want to get hung up on that. So my point here is this. If peace is not only cessation of againstness to God, but if peace is an attribute deposited in me from God, then let's say I get up every day and like those dogs I just referenced that are searching for the truffles, I go out in pursuit of peace. That is not trying to be, I'm happy with everybody and everything pleases me. Somebody cuts me off and nearly takes off the front end of my car like the other day, I'm going to smile and say, bless your heart. <laughs> That's not it either. Okay, So we have to be clear about what this actually means. So, to follow peace with all. Let's put the sentence together. So, diokete meta panton. Let's stop there. I'm kind of dividing this like that. It means the earnest desire that is actually the will of God placed in your heart. That's a better way to say it. That is looking upon your fellow individuals, your whoever they are, man or woman or even children, and looking at them the same way Christ has looked at you, with compassion, with forgiveness. My message on forgiveness should kick in here, but I want to just try and stay focused. So the point I'm making, without the Lord putting that deposit in our hearts, we can, we can attempt superficial peace, but it will not be the peace of God which passes all understanding. It'll be the peace of man that can be fractured or mankind can be fractured at any moment for any reason because. That's all. So distinguishing these things makes us not, may, lets us know what the text does not say. It does not say go out and try and do this thing. For God does not send us out unequipped. So the thing that is needed is already inside of us. And because of how I've described this imperative it means you get up and you go, but it may not happen today. You don't use that as a crutch. You simply get up and go as if. And trust me, I have had the conflict of having to deal with, I truly would like to pursue peace with all. But there is one little area that is made clear for me in the Bible, which I am not to be peaceful about. And that is protecting myself from apostasy, protecting myself and my faith from the ne'er do wells who'd like to tell me I'm wasting my time or it's a foolish endeavor. But equally, the thing that this tells me is anything that offends or touches the church, I am not to be peaceable about. And I'll give you my text for that. It starts with Jesus in the temple where he, he didn't say, now look, I'm, I'm the peace, I'm the prince of peace. So because I'm the prince of peace, I'm all asking you real kindly if you just leave my father's house and... And, but rather, if you want to put it in colloquial terms, use your imagination, because I think our version of what was said is probably watered down and mild compared to what it should actually read that was said. But he throws these people out. He actually comes at them with a, a weapon, if you will, I don't know what you want to call it, but like, whether it's a cat, cat of tails or whatever it's called, comes at them to, to drive them out. So there is an exception, and I'm going to tell you I can find multiple to support that. Anything that touches the church, we are to be vigilant about. Not fanatical, but vigilant. 
So the vigilance that is required here to follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, speaks volumes to me. It says that there first must be the act of God towards me and in me. Without that, I'm just standing here treading water. You're just sitting here doomed. There must first be the act that God does within the heart of the believer. That lets me take the next step, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, italics, but bring trouble, and thereby many be defiled. And what's that saying? It's saying this. You realize that that horizontal relationship can be poison to your faith. The minute you start acting in the flesh and you start trying to act in the flesh to counterbalance what may be a horizontal attack, a root of bitterness, some poison, some element that is foreign to your body now as you are in Christ can come in and use this analogy all the way, lest any root of bitterness spring up. That being said, essentially the whole tree can be killed off for the disease that starts in the soul can spread through the body, ruin the faith, and essentially it says many be defiled. That, that's what that's meaning. This, that is why I've told you many times when I've delivered to you the message on forgiveness, I've said to you, you are forgiving people not because you hope that they'll say, I accept and I forgive you too. You forgive people so that the separation that could come between you and God doesn't come. Why? Because once you have bitterness in your heart, Ephesians 4.32 says, putting away, be kind to one another, putting away all malice, bitterness, forgiving one another for Christ's sake. This is the meaning of that. Somebody had the wisdom of God in writing these words on paper, inspired by the Holy Spirit to tell us that if our horizontal relationships begin to erode in, in such a way that they become toxic and poison, they will probably ruin you. Now, ask the question, it's innocent, don't put a camera on anybody. How many have had that? Where you have contention, you're dealing with stuff, and whereas before you didn't have hatred and you didn't have malice, now you hate because people are attacking. or they're Probably, you know what, I don't want you to raise your hand. There's probably too many of us. <laughs> the reality is that's, that is the new reality. But it doesn't have to be like that. And if you keep reading, it explains it even more. Remember, there's that semicolon. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Now, I have to say this because people have made great interpretations of this. Fornicator, the Greek word, porneo, porne, is usually used to translate anything pretty close to our English word that is porno, pornographic, that lends towards an abuse of the natural or an exploitation of the natural. But in this case, when it says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, we do not read anywhere that Esau was a fornicator. Okay? So let's be really careful about the interpretation of what's being said here. We know Esau, the brother of Jacob. Remember from birth, it's said many times over. Jacob I loved, God speaking. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. And if you reread that passage in Genesis that tells of Jacob and Esau's crazy, very bad relationship, Jacob's desire to have the blessing of his father, which basically he tricks his father into giving him the blessing by disguising himself as Esau. But if you read carefully, Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You remember when Esau came to Jacob and he said, give me to eat. What will you give me in exchange? My birthright. If you're, that, if you're going to be that cheap with the things of God, if you're going to be that cheap with the blessings of God, if you're going to be that cheap with the word of God, if you're going to be that cheap to just blow off God, to satisfy your fleshly desires, hunger, thirst, coveting after something, if you're that cheap, God calls you a fornicator because essentially you have turned your faith, you've prostituted your faith into something else that it's not, peddling it as faith, but it's not. And profane person meaning not discerning the spiritual things, which Esau 
absolutely fit that bill. Right. So Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. Your Bible in the margin says, way to change his mind. He found no way to change his mind. Why? Because the God that had, that had promised the promise in that family, essentially, after he treated his birthright blessing so cheaply, there wasn't any way back for him. There was no way back because basically the thing that bonded him to God, he gave up for food. You think about that. Don't for a minute think that this is archaic. There will be people every single Sunday won't come to church. Why? Because there's a football game on. And all my friends are coming over. And that's way more important than coming and learning about God. Now, I used to think, oh, don't be so hard on people like that. You know, they got to live. Do your living during the week. How about taping the game? How about paying attention and not being? Because I, I view all of it now like that. If you're not serious about what you're doing with God, then you should just abandon ship, friends, because God is not playing games. This is not a game of cards where if you lose one hand, you'll get another. This is the life you get. These are the opportunities you're given to go out and seize. By God's grace, he's called you to something greater than to just say, I have something more important to do. This is why I find it so offensive when people make every excuse, even when they're sick, to not be in church. With this message being, being the last in this series, I want to talk a little bit about the path that for many of these people in the book of Hebrews led to their destruction and demise. They listened to other people. They listened primarily to people who had an Old Testament either teaching or mindset that said, whatever you've been instructed is not right. And this is why the bulk of Hebrews, the bulk of the body, contains a lot of Old Testament quotations. When you're writing to people who are most familiar with those scriptures, those are the scriptures you're going to use to make your point and drive it home crystal clear. This is what the writer did. So, let's look at the last part here. Without which, without peace, and without this word, hagiasmon, that is holiness. Without these two elements, which are actually connected, as I'm trying to explain, Udais, no one, it says no man, but no one, man or woman, will see the Lord. Now, why is this so important? I'm going to read a few passages, a few verses from what Paul writes in Galatians. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, which, by the way, is our akatharsia word, so not being cleansed by the word, okay? Lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they, sh that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, elsewhere, Paul, writing to another group of people, says, no whoremonger, and he lists the list. He says, shall see or enter into the kingdom. But he says, you were, you were that at one time, but you're not anymore. You've been washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You were that, but you're not anymore. And I'd say that all of these, which I've just read out of Galatians, which are works of the flesh, we're, we are all no strangers to that. We're all very familiar. Hatred, wrath, these things, including, let's just talk about this. Adultery's been around forever. All you've got to do is read the book. You'll find it in there. You'll find it in as many places as you can count. So it's not a new concept. But adultery is more prevalent today than it ever was. Why? Because we don't have the moorings. We just, we want to please the flesh, what we desire. The difficulty of people actually treating other people, this horizontal relationship, even if you're man and wife, to understand, to respect, versus the minute something displeasing happens, you're ready to just throw it all away. 
Now, I've told you, my saying is you bought it, you own it. If it's broken, you fix it. So, but these are the things that people would just say very cavalierly, it doesn't matter, and there are no consequences. Do you know what this all sums up? In fact, most of the preaching on this subject has summed up, summed up something very profound. There are consequences to everything. There are consequences to everything. And if you think that there are no consequences because God is made in your image how you'd like to perceive him, God who is all forgiving, sitting up there on his throne and saying, yes, I know you, my daughter and my son, I know you had temptation. And you know what, honestly, if I was looking at what you were looking at, I would have succumbed too. But you know, in general, and you know, no, I'm sorry, that's not the way God's going to talk. This is why I said to you, there's nothing in this book that we can't make a modern-day application. When did Satan come? When did the devil come to tempt Christ? When he was at his weakest? 40 days of fasting? And perceived that he could dupe him with some good words that would be gracious to him. This is why Christ said, man shall not live by bread alone. He's quoting Deuteronomy. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, which means in the time of temptation, we turn to the book. You plant something firmly in your head, especially for people who know. If you know what your weakness is, and you know your propensity to that weakness, you go to the book and you find something that clearly helps you. Paul wrote, There is no temptation such as common to man, but with that temptation God also provides a way of escape. In other words, you don't have to succumb to it. So all of these things are very important to understanding this peace, the pursuit of peace, and the holiness of God. Now, this particular use of holiness, I need to talk about that. I'm going to run just a little bit over. This, this word for holiness, in its context, has more to do with a practical understanding than all of the uses that I've said before. Practical as in, if we understand that holiness or that set-apartness can only be done by God to us, and therefore we have been separated out from among those for him, for his purpose, then it's important to understand practically what this means. I am to pursue, I'm to get up and let's say I start my day every day like this, to pursue with the intent of peace, which may not happen, but that should be in my heart, should be in my mind, just as much as the holiness of God, which is, think of it this way, when I say the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God, so if I get up and I'm not acting in faith and I'm not pleasing God, the, if you want to call it the holiness element is not activated or acting And therefore, I begin once more to operate in the flesh, which means anything that's been done, I have fallen away from. This is why the writer says, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. That's what that means. You've been given these tools. Use them. You've been given this manna from heaven. Eat it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Do not reject anything coming from this book that may help you gain better understanding of where you are not and where God desires you to be. Now, if you go back in your own time and reread the 12th chapter completely, you get a good sense of connecting last week and this week together. Why? Because we not only suffer the chastening of God, but we suffer the buffeting. Sometimes it's the the wrath, the envy, the hatred of others. What's our first instinct? Our first instinct is to retaliate well, I'm not going to just stand here and let somebody do this to me. We're talking about issues of the faith. But rather, this is what I've come to know. If the whole body of Christ would just stand on the word in solidarity, not being fractioned by or divided by, and I'm, I'm at this point, I'm sorry, I'm not including the Catholic Church in this, okay? They have a different belief, and anybody who studies the Catholic Church will recognize that there is volumes upon volumes upon volumes of dogma that has been written by men who were not inspired by God, why would you tell people to pray to Mary when nowhere in this book does it say pray to her? Why would you say 
Jesus, yes, but he's too holy. You, you need another way of approach when it says no one comes to him except they be drawn by the Father and they relate to Jesus. And I could keep going. It's a long litany of things. Purgatory, the saints, which I've talked about. You have to die in the church. You have to die and have had a certified, certifiable miracle to be called a saint, whereas every book written by the Apostle Paul says, and to the saints at such and such a place, which says he views all people that are in the church as saints of God, alive saints of God, not dead, not waiting for a miracle to happen or for you to perform one. So when I say I'm excluding Catholicism, excluding Catholicism, all of the fractionated denominations within Christendom, if they would stand on the word, and I'll tell you this much, yes, we have a difference of how things should be interpreted. Do you know why? We're greatly influenced by what mom and dad or grandma and grandpa believe. We're greatly influenced by, oh, this leader of the church. When I've said to you all along, and if I haven't said it recently, my apologies to you. Go and check out what I'm saying. If you can find a helps for Greek, go and check it out. Don't just take my word on what I'm saying. Research what I'm saying so you can be sure. If we're talking about your eternal destiny, you want to make darn sure that what I'm saying to you is the truth. And some of you say, okay, pastor, you've got a track record. I believe you already. But for the ones who don't, I don't want you to be blind and follow me blindly. I want you to say you have combed, you have searched. These are the answers that you need to make it in. God's not very complicated. You know, he wants more than anything. I've said this before. I'll say it again. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to take him at his word. He wants you to have faith. He doesn't say be perfect. He doesn't say go out and do these things, and if you don't do them, I'll be displeased. He does say this one thing I ask of you, trust me. Take me at my word that when I sent my only begotten son to die on earth for your sins and for my sins, it really is true. He did that, and he took them away. They're nailed to the cross so that you shouldn't suffer the consequences of those acts committed in your body or the state you were born in, in Adam. So what I'm saying to you, and I love this, this passage because it explains to me how we can become casual, how we can become complacent. And interesting, in, in Luke's gospel, there is something where it says the believer is called son of peace, I think that's Luke 10. I don't know the, the, the verse. You'll find it, might, maybe 6 or 9. Sons of peace. That means you and me. It doesn't mean somebody else. It means you and me. Now, there'll be people out there who will object loudly and say, I'm not going to stand by and let this happen to me. As I said, if it's things touching the things of God, and I say this very, very carefully. Why? Because... I'm bought and paid for with the blood of Christ. Therefore, I belong to him, and I'm, I therefore become a thing that belongs to God. But I'm talking about things that cannot think for themselves, such as the body. The body of the church may be fragmented because not all have the same mindset. To keep the unity of the peace, the bond of peace, which is why Paul talks about the preparation of being shod with the gospel of peace. All of these things tell us something God desires for us, not necessarily for fellow man, but for our relationship with him. So when it says, follow peace with all, it doesn't say make an exception, other than the exception that I pointed out clearly, something that cannot protect or defend itself. I say this to you, would you protect or defend an individual who could not defend themselves. If you walk, went out on the street corner today and saw someone in a wheelchair being beat up for their, their, their pocketbook, would you just stand still and say, well, I, I have to be peaceful? Or would you get out there and do the right thing? That's what I'm talking about. There are times when your, your actions will not fit into a box, but God sees the heart and says, this is right. Now, the perverted work people out there, they'll say, they're on a mission for God. Those perverted work people will say, we're doing God's work. You've heard that before. But look at their work. That's what will give away where they're getting their orders from. If their work is to destroy, to tear down, to bring constant animosity, envyings, hatred, strife, it's the work of the flesh, and it is not the work of the Spirit of God. Somebody says, I have a mission from God and their whole mission is destruction, their God is the devil. Just take it for what it is. There'll never be a person 
man or woman, stand in front of you and say, I come in peace. That's not endeavoring for peace. That's not trying for peace. It doesn't mean it'll happen. And I'm not talking about Jimmy Carter peace, all right? Forget about that. <laughs> Whew. And everybody thought the Antichrist was there. Wrong. Anyway, my point is this. If we glean from this book, it's going to at least make us aware. And having an awareness is where you and I actually get real with God. Not having an awareness, you'll never get real. It'll never be real to you. You'll never take it to heart. But something that now you're aware of, you'll put in your brain. Will you execute it properly? No, probably not. None of us will. But what has been placed in the heart is what God desires. That at least keeps the awareness, which keeps the mindset that says, I'm not going there, and I'm not going there. And I'm telling you something that is wonderful. If we have this wonderful teaching and admonition for us, something tells me we should pay attention to it, not let it slip. And that's not meaning to say, and I need to reemphasize this, it's not meaning to say that following peace with all is going out of your way and doing everything. And it's the sloppy agape we talk about, that ooh, stay away from me stuff, but rather what God has placed in your heart, the awareness that could bring about change in you. It may not, I don't know, that's between you and God, but at least you're aware of it now. That becomes the most important thing. What you do with it, that's between you and God. I am not your personal police person looking to try and see, are you doing this and are you carrying it out? That's between you and him, just as it's between me and my maker to work out. But he's given us the tools, so now the fun part begins. That's called application, if anyone so desires. Not my instruction anymore, not my business, all yours. I hope you deal well with this subject. Think about it, meditate, pray on it, and perhaps rereading this passage, great clarity for the whole subject matter will come to fruition. And that's what I pray. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.